Hello and welcome to a live after reading. I'm Tim Niederreiter, and with me today is a guest who's new to the podcast, but not exactly to the podcast sphere. Alan Baxter, welcome to the show. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. You know, I mean, a decent writing day today, and for me, it's the end of the day as we record this. But for you, it's the middle, so you know, Australian and all that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be having lunch after I chat to you, and then get an afternoon of writing in. So. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, so. Alan, tell the listeners a little bit about, little bit about your books and the sort of stuff you do with uh, fiction out there. Okay. Um, well, I write mostly... Well, I, I've got sort of two different streams of writing. Under my own name, I write mostly horror and dark fantasy. Um, anything short stories, novellas, novels. Um, and I've never met a genre I didn't like, so mm. I tend to <laughs> include a lot of crime and mystery and stuff like that within those sort of overarching genres. Uh, and I co-write <clears throat> co a lot of stuff with David Wood. Mm. And we tend to do action-adventure novels in the Jake Crowley series or sort of monster thrillers with the Sam Aston series. So, uh, yeah, always busy with something. Yeah, that's where I first heard of, heard of from you is I heard about you on the on David Wood's podcasts and well, maybe on the Dead Robot Society before that, honestly. But, you know. Mm. Well, me and Dave did a podcast together for more than 100 episodes um, sort of back in the day. And then right. we both got sort of too busy to keep it up. And, yeah, Dave, Dave still goes with his own sort of infrequent one that then every once in a while I guest on for nostalgia's sake. Yeah. Podca podcasting takes time. It takes takes time out of being a writer. I should know. I mean, I, this is my – I think I'm onward – I'm over 300 episodes of podcasts now, so – Wow, that's good going. Total between my two shows. I mean, the, the one show mm. that's currently on hiatus is no longer currently adding episodes, but I've added a bunch to this one lately. Anyway, easier just to bullshit with authors than come up with a topic that actually try to try to educate people about anything, <laughs> like the other show would try to do occasion. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So, Alan, uh, you say dark, dark fantasy and horror. Those that's really that's kind of in my wheelhouse. I know I I've, I actually maybe this is the thing is I kind of I like reading and listening and watching horror a lot. At least lately, I've been realizing like wow, that's kind of my jam. I, I'm surprised, but because I never thought of myself as like a horror guy for a long time. I thought like oh, that's not my really my thing. I like fantasy and science fiction. But if it's not dark, it actually starts bothering me after a while. <laughs> so yeah, well, there's kind of a combination there. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I never really considered myself a horror writer until other people started calling me that. Um, I was always very much into sort of thrillers and fantasy and especially sort of contemporary fantasy like mm. with the Alex Kane series. It's like a dark urban fantasy that's sort of a crossover between a... This, you know, like somebody, uh, one of the reviewers referred to the Alex Kane character as like Jack Reacher with a spell book. Oh. Um, but it does, which is which I've used a lot since because that's really useful. <laughs> and it sounds like a good explanation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it is it is dark. It is always kind of dark, and there are elements about it that are very much uh, would be considered more horror than anything else. Um, and so I sort of, and I've always enjoyed horror. I would always read a lot of fantasy and stuff, but I always loved reading like Stephen King and James Herbert and Clive Barker is probably my all time favorite author. Oh, Clive Barker. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now there's so a writer. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, um, I've, once, I've once or twice here and there, people have uh, sort of compared my work or certain books to, um, Clive Barker. And that's just the, the highest possible praise as far as I'm concerned. That's somebody, a win. I wrote yeah. a novel called devouring dark that somebody said, if, uh, if lock, stock and two smoking barrels was, was written by Clive Barker, it would be this book and say, it's like that. Just Ooh. now I just wrote on that high for weeks. <laughs> yeah. Now that's, now that's impressive. That's a good, that's a good yeah, compliment there. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, that's, so now, I mean, I embrace it. It's like, you know what? Yeah, I am a horror writer, not just a horror writer, but yeah, very much yeah. one, a lot of, you know, most of my stuff is, most of it is supernatural to some degree so there's you know whether it's like full sort of magic going on like in the Alex Kane series or whether it's just kind of weird supernatural like some of the other stuff um but it is all dark fiction and a lot of it does definitely fall into what you call horror yeah you, you use the term weird there and that really interests me because weird is is also very much up my alley I mean I love the weirdest world building the weirdest like characterization sometimes mm. is really fun mm. 
and I, I and the monsters, of course. I love I love my monsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a lot of the time back in the day before horror was really sort of um, coined as a term with back with, you know, Lovecraft and yeah. Clark Ashton Smith and all that sort of era. People, they would write weird fiction. That's what it was known as, you know, like Weird Tales was the magazine where a lot of it was was published. And it was this kind of strange, dark, mystical, supernatural, whatever. Uh, and it would just usually be classified as weird fiction. And, and I like that. Um, as a, as a descriptor, because a lot of the time, you know, especially these days, thanks to the eighties, mostly, if you say horror, people think of slasher movies and horror is so much broader and so much deeper than just, you know, slashes or, or blood and guts that, um, a lot of the time you need to find a way to sort of remind people of that. And, you know, dark, weird fiction is a, is an, is a good descriptor of stuff that makes people stop and think what it might actually be about. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was funny because I've been kind of on a kick with the uh, 80s uh, sci-fi horror stuff with the movies lately. Uh, mm. And those are very much kind of they very much uh, kinship with slasher movies, you know, like Alien, Predator uh, and The Terminator. All of those are pretty much they all have a slasher element to them, basically. But the difference is, yeah, but quite, those are very as distinctive well. as well. There's so much going on in each mm. of those movies. That, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of staggering when you think about it. Like, these are all kind of, especially Predator and Alien, are definitely slasher movies at their heart in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, they are, but there's a lot there's a lot of depth, too. Or you look at something like Event Horizon or The Thing, mm. um, and they're Ooh, very the much thing. in that sort of body, body horror vein, but there's a lot more to it than just the, the, the body horror on top. You know, they're much deeper stories. Yes, and... And then it's for some reason when you say body horror, well, I mean, I, it's obvious, but when you say body horror, I can't help but remember what is it, Franz Kafka, the Metamorphosis, which is maybe the proto body horror. Um, because the guys just, yeah, I woke I mean, up and I was a cockroach one day. Great. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, and then we're also back in the in the realm of weird fiction too. Obviously right. That would that would classify. Yeah, that'd be weird literature at that point. <laughs> yeah, weird lit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if only that was a thing. I guess it kind of is. It's, it's like with magical realism now. They've got that, and with the uh, yeah literary yeah, like I suspense mean, or whatever, they often have like these supernatural elements. Yeah, and a lot of the time that's just something they they're using to market horror without you know putting people off by calling it horror. It's like that's you know, true. It's a straight yeah. up horror film like Get Out or something and people try to market it as quiet horror or something. It's like, or, no, fuck <laughs> off. It's, it, that's just a, that's a horror movie. Like, exactly. You know, stop, stop being so scared of it. It's just, yeah. I mean, you can be scared of it but only because it's effective. <laughs> that's right. Stop yeah, avoiding yeah, it though. It's... Yeah, embrace it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Then run away. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. Embrace it and then hide. Yeah, then hide. Yeah, that's more, that's more like it, yeah. Uh, take it with you and hide. <laughs> now that'd be scary. <laughs> Just watch a scary movie while I'm hiding from the monster. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, obviously, there's a lot uh, of difficulties in the world right now. But like, I was th- I was also thinking like, I, I wonder how these disaster movies really fit fit with horror because I, I had this author in my writing group. Uh, um, he's still I'm still kind of a attached to it but he would write like he his favorite movie is like twister you know he'd write tornado movies he's a, he's a storm chaser in real life yeah i think i've had him on the show yeah i've had him on the oh. show before drew bernardi he's, he's he's a small time author but like he, uh, he his book was about you know about a tornado that didn't that didn't get detected came through in the middle of the night and just destroys a town something pretty good but it, and it feels very much like a stephen king book and it's that kind of thing like there's all this character buried in with the horror elements and the disaster elements. And I, th- I find that very fascinating as well. Uh, King yeah, especially well, I mean, is good at that. Yeah, yeah that, exactly. I mean, when it comes down to it, that's just a good book. That's what you want. You want right. something that's got good characterization and deeper themes. It's not just this sort of superficial. A lot of the time with a movie, it really is just a disaster movie. But the reason you really get into it, you've got all the visual with a movie you've got all the visuals of the disaster but you only really care about it because of the characters that are involved and whether you know they're going to get away or who's going to die before the end and that's the that's the case when we write as well where we can lean deeper into that because it it's the written word and so we want we want, want good characters and we want good stories so that Stephen King is often um it well, usually shelved with general fiction or thrillers but you know he's a horror writer we all know that but he is also <laughs> a thriller writer so you yeah. know that's kind of how it works 
Yeah, and he I mean, obviously he's got a lot of, of a large variety uh, of work, much like yourself under his belt, mm. more than <laughs> most people. <laughs> but like, you know, he's, got, he's got his weird fantasy. You know, he's got the Dark Tower. He's got. Th- and, his, and if you count his pen names, like the Running Man was one of his, you know, all that stuff. You know, there's yeah, some, Richard there's, Beckman, yeah. Yeah, the science fiction type stuff, you know. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. Sci- well, near future, like dystopian, I guess, maybe is what you would call that now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, you'll see the Dark Tower shelved with the science fiction and fantasy, and you'll see everything else shelved with general fiction or thrillers or whatever. So, yeah, it's... Uh, this, and, this is a problem with genres, you see. Difficult. Yes, find. especially when, the when you know... Uh, I don't know where Westerns get shelved these days, probably with general fiction, honestly, or somewhere else, or historical fiction. But if there is even a section for that, geez. I haven't been to a bookstore in forever, yeah, you can probably tell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, and it's been way more than a year since I've been in a Barnes & Noble or anything like that. Uh, but I was thinking, like, you know, where do you put, uh, if it, you know, if, it, if putting even putting The Dark Tower in fantasy is kind of a stretch compared to most of the other fantasy books, right? Like, it's fantasy... But the main character's a goddamn cowboy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, that's the thing. I mean, and that's the beauty of, like, genre mixing. It's the beauty of being able to search up on places like Amazon instead of going to a bookstore because you're not restricted to one spot in the, sh- in the store. But, you know, categories and genres are invented for bookstores for shelving. and They don't really exist because, you know, there's, there's not one book of mine that you could put in a single genre. The big, the biggest fiction in all of fiction, <laughs> the genre. Yeah, well, it is really. You're right. It is. Yeah. So, uh, so Alan, yeah. I, as far as uh, what you've been doing lately, what kind of, what kind, do you have any, uh, yeah, you know, well, yeah. What's your most recent book? I guess I'm just kind of curious because it's been a bit since I've checked up on your catalog. <laughs> well, I just the, the new book just came out last month, which is, uh, which is the Gulp, which is a sort of a mosaic novel of five interconnected novellas stay in a mm. fictional Australian harbour town where just weird and creepy shit goes on. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the one that's just come out. So that's what I'm sort of uh, busy talking about mostly at the moment. Okay. That's, that's my Castle Rock, that, so talking of Stephen King. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> created this place that I, can, that I can revisit. And so with any luck, it, it seems very popular so far, and people are already saying they want more, which is a good thing. So I get to write more, and I've got this. I can continue to build the mythology of this sort of weird and creepy fictional Australian harbour town. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, it's funny. That reminds me of, uh, well, I got it for Christmas, actually. It was... Uh, uh, this n- manga collection by Junji Ito. If you've ever heard of, never heard of Junji Ito, he's a yep. horror manga yep, guy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, mm. and this is it was this is probably his most famous one. It's Uzumaki, and that's kind of set in this like little town. This is just going insane over the course of the story. Um, yeah, very Lovecrafty so, yeah, in that one. Vibe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So and and so and so is mine. That's that thing. I I love that weird fiction. I love the cosmic horror sort of vibe. I love small town horror and creepy places and creepy people living in strange isolated towns and all that stuff just is so much fun for me so uh, yeah that that's that's what i did and decided to to make my own and to and to make it very much australian because you know it's uh, yeah i i put out a novella at the start of last year which was you know really more of a, a bit of a gag than anything else uh, called the Rue, which is just about a demonic kangaroo that just <laughs> decimates an outback town. It's just like it's like you know, just this crazy splattergore extravaganza yeah, parody just, of a, a, of a horror gangbusters. story. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, yeah, and, and people, yeah, people have been really enjoying it, and uh, which is fantastic. It's, it's been it's been good fun, and so I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to do that thing then with the Australian town. People are people are ready for some crazy Australian horror. So <laughs> with the gulp, it's not not quite as gonzo and sort mm-hmm. of splatterpunk as as the Rue was. That was deliberately a sort of like a B movie novella if you take Jaws or Razorback or something but put make it a kangaroo. <laughs> um, <laughs> whereas the, the golf is the golf is a little more serious, a little more um sort of actual varied and horror than just Gonzo like the Rue was, but uh but very much embracing that Australian vibe. Yeah, so did you put out the Rue yourself or was it uh, did you find a publisher for that? Oh, I did. I put it it's interesting. I way back in the dark ages um I did the bit of self-publishing earlier on um, and quickly decided that that was a lot of work and mm. I didn't really want to have to do that much work. And it sure can be. Subsequently, <laughs> yeah, so I've subsequently been working with publishers. The Alex Kane series is with HarperCollins in Australia and um, otherwise I've been doing a lot of stuff with a variety of small press, um, mm. grey matter press mostly recently. Um, 
Uh, and, and you know that's been that I've been lucky enough to work with these good publishers, and that's been going well for me. But um, with the Rue, it, because as, as I said, it was a bit of you know it was a bit of a joke, really, a bit of a just a fun thing mm-hmm. to do. Um, and I think there's no point in trying to find a publisher for it or drag it out. And people were keen, and it was one of those things. It's like, well, let's just drop it straight away because there was a bit of buzz. So I just dusted off the old self-publishing. <laughs> skills and relearned the new stuff that's a lot's changed in you know the 10 years or so or more since I did it um, and so I put that out because I've been thinking that you know it's the hybrid sort of model is uh, is becoming ever more popular these days you know so yeah. with some publishers some small press do some stuff on your own it's good to sort of spread things out a little bit um, and I didn't really know what I would do on that front until the Rue came up. And so I thought, well, look, here's a perfect opportunity. I'll just going to put this out myself and see what happens. Um, and then subsequently it, it did really well. So I had another short novella that was in a anthology that hadn't been sort of widely read. So I put out a, a version of that as well. Um, and then subsequently with the gulp, the new one, I decided to put that out myself too, just because I, you know, it's just been interesting to do that again. And it's nice to have a few bits that are just under, just under my control. I would. I do still prefer working with publishers because I don't like the amount of work involved. Mm. Um, I, I'd rather just do the writing and let the publishers, you know, figure out all the editing and cover and all that sort of stuff. That's the advantage of working with them. Um, but yeah, so I've I've enjoyed doing a couple of indie things as well and just just spreading my work out a bit that way. No, it makes sense. I uh, yeah, I've n- I've not worked with a publisher in the past, at least not anyone of. Not 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 a real publisher. I mean, some indie presses, right? They're just <laughs> authors in their house. Um, I've worked with some of those for anthologies and stuff, but not not a whole lot of actual editing of uh, actual uh, even that. Yeah. But I do. I, I think it's cool that I mean, I really like the indie publishing process. I mean, obviously, each to their own, right? And you you know, if you want to just write books, hybrid or traditional is better, probably. But uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah. I think you do have to you do have to enjoy that indie process um to do a good job of it otherwise it just becomes a chore um and i decided back in the day that i didn't enjoy it enough i just wanted to write and you know just kind of come full circle a little bit now i've sort of got to the point is like you know what it's not bad to do a bit of it i don't want to do all my work that way i'd rather keep things you know ticking over but i i actually do enjoy a little bit here and there so i think that's the plan now but yeah, but uh, back to the Rue for a second. I mean, isn't it isn't it funny how like that's the thing that happened? Like this is this one blew up. This is like the little indie the little indie book that could that does <laughs> really surprisingly better than you'd expect. It it, it always is yeah. those weird ones for some like those kind of like like this is exceptionally kind of uh, schlocky or or goofy yeah. or whatever. And then that's it's it's funny how that works, right? I guess people can see that can tell the sense of humor when they see like a a book with that title and that cover. I'm sure, yeah. That's that's definitely part of it. Yeah, I mean, if if any of us knew what the hell we were doing, we would all be millionaires because everybody's just floundering around trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. Oh yeah. But um, with this one, I mean, it it came up. It was a joke initially because there was a <clears throat> a newspaper story about um, this sort of angry Rue in this outback town that was digging up people's gardens and was kind of threatening people and bouncing around. Um, and so a bunch of people were laughing and joking about that. And so Keel and Patrick Burke just mocked up this old sort of zebra horror cover from the eighties um, of what it would be like if that was a, as it was a horror novel. And it just sort of set off this whole chain of events. And because I was the only Australian in the conversation, everybody just started going, you should write it, you should write it. Um, and then <clears throat> it was all a joke, but then I started getting private messages from people going, no, seriously, you should write this, it would be hilarious. So <laughs> I basically did, and there's just, just this long list. Everybody who badgered me on Twitter to write the story, um, I just listed their names, and then I just used all those names for the characters. And ah. so everybody who badgered me to write it gets brutally murdered by the kangaroo during the course of the book. <laughs> so, How are you like it yeah, now? So it was yeah. just good. Yeah, exactly. So, and now, and then, you know, even, even that sort of helped because people were like, "Oh my god, I can't believe I'm in it! I can't wait to see how I die." <laughs> so people were, so it generated this whole sort of thing about it, and it just it just became really good fun. Roundabout, it was all round about Christmas in 2019. I put the book out at the end of January 2020, and yeah, and it just people were just like really enjoying it. So yeah, we've had a lot of fun with it, and it's still ticking along. You know, it's, uh, oh yeah, you nice. can't argue with it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, one last question about that. I, do you know how many, how, Do you remember how long it was, or I mean, how many pages, how many words, that kind of thing? Uh, it's about it's about thirty thousand words. It's like it's okay, page, okay, so, so like a hundred page book. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and those those short books can be surprisingly effective. I've noticed, like my some of my bestsellers were back when I was publishing like series of novellas instead of novels, and. Yeah. Yeah, and I, maybe I should get back to doing shorter, shorter books because I'm writing big dark fantasy right now, <laughs> and those are yeah. not doing super well. They're just too big, I think, for people to invest in right away. It, it, that can be part of it. Um, I, I think as well, especially with horror and dark fiction, that that novella length is a really good length for that sort of genre. Mm. Um, it's the old sort of pulp novels. Some of the best pulp novels um, oh, yeah. that you think of as actual novels from the days were only sort of maybe forty or fifty thousand words. Sort of technically novella length, really, um, and with the gulp, I put a whole, you know, novel length book together. But it's five novellas that make mm-hmm. up the book. So, um, and I've been with Grey Matter Press. I've been working on a um, novella series there as well with the Eli Carver books. We put out Manifest Recall, and then the sequel to that was called Recall Night, and came out last year. And and they've been really popular. They're about 40, 35, 40 thousand word books. Um, and I'm working on the third one in that series now. So, it's in it's it's a popular link um i think you know sort of people's attention spans are shifting a little bit but even when i write full-length novels they're usually you know 80 90 thousand words at most i don't tend to write big fat books even though i do enjoy reading them sometimes yeah one hundred twenty thousand. i mean i have one book that's one hundred seventy thousand words i'm not doing that again that was a little bit much i've resolved yeah. to write shorter books since then <laughs> Yeah. And that would take a whole I, year I to write. To, yeah, it's a little insane. Yeah, well, that's the thing as well. Yeah, I mean, I do tend to write. My novels tend to sort of be somewhere around the 90,000 word mark. Um, and I am trying to, just recently, I've been doing more standalone stuff in the novels rather than series. I work, I write series with Dave. Um, but yeah, I've been working on sort of standalone novels and writing novellas. And if I'm going to connect things, I think it tends to, at the moment at least, it seems like I'm writing series in shorter books and novel length of standalone stuff so but you know it changes year to year it just depends where the where the winds of whimsy drag me you know <laughs> yeah whims- whimsical horror whimsical whimsical fear making <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah, yeah so i wouldn't you- say my books are particularly whimsical but uh <laughs> my, my method can be <laughs> oh it's good to hear you know i uh I, I frequently think I, I'm just not doing enough. I'm just I'm not consistent enough. You know, do you do you have a writing routine or anything like that? Not strictly. Um, I have I, I have this sort of loose plan to basically release at least one book under my name and one with Dave each year. Okay. Um, so you know, beyond that, and often I do end up putting out more than that if. Um, shorter novellas do come out or you know stuff comes out in anthologies and short stories in magazines and whatever else that sort of all always happens Mm -hmm. but i try to make sure that at least one book of my own each year whether it's a new collection or a new novel or whatever um and often i will put out more than one um depending on publishers and whatever Uh, and with dave with with the two series that we're writing we try to make sure that at least one from one series or the other um, does come out each year, and on a couple of occasions we put one out from each series in the same year. But um, it just you know it depends on how much time we both have and what what time's available. But so yeah, I'm not I'm not sort of super strict on it, but um, that that is the sort of vibe I tend to follow, and I've stuck to it pretty well for the last few years. Yeah, you know, the steady the steady grind can be can be just or not grind so much as the steady progress, you know, steady movement that gets that gets words out, that gets books done, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's and, and I think that's what I think that's sort of what's important is people beat themselves up about you know, um, you know, I, I'm not doing enough or I should be doing this or I should be doing that. And it's like you know, just I, and I don't believe strictly in in writing rules or anything like that. All you got to do is write. So just write, you know, as much and as consistently as you can, and just put work out as frequently as you can, or submit to publishers whatever as frequently as you can, and just try to keep that going. Um, you know. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there and just try to keep yourself as you know as current as you can and just see where you roll with it yeah definitely we talked about some books some other other people's books earlier in this podcast but I'm curious do you have time to read fiction these days do you, do you make 
clear time for that or, do you, or is it mostly you're getting yeah. your stories elsewhere yeah no no most definitely i i voracious reader um oh. I'm, to be honest i'm in a little bit of a reading slump at the moment which happens every once in a while but um that i think that's just because i've been so busy outside of my writing life as well but mm. um i normally read read a book or two a week um okay it, it's pretty normal for me to average 50 60 books a year um because that's just always been my you know passion that sort of started all this is reading it's like most evenings i'll sort of sit and chill with a book um more often than not um i do sort of watch a lot of movies and netflix and shudder and stuff like that as well but uh yeah my my usual downtime is reading oh cool so and what's your what what's the most recent book you read that you would recommend anyway um i've well actually talking about um fat fantasy that i don't sort of tend to write even though i enjoy it there's um there's a series by an author called fonda lee she wrote mm. the Greenbone saga um jade city was the first one and i just finished reading jade war which is the second one um and there's a third the third one in a trilogy jade legacy is out later this year which i'm really looking forward to so i, I just the, that was the book i just most recently finished was was jade war it's it's fantastic it's basically like a sort of fantasy magic version of a shaw brothers hong kong Kung Fu movie. It's um, it's sort of set in this fictional world on the island of Jan Lun, which is sort of a allegory to Hong Kong in a way, um, mm. although it's there's more to it than that. But but it's just it's beautiful. It's really well done. It's uh, it's a really good series. So cool. Yeah, I've been reading. I just recently picked up uh, Wizard of Earthsea because I've not read that book before. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, of course. Uh, yeah. I read that every couple of years, probably. That's one of my favorite series. Oh, wow. Not okay. much that I reread. Yeah, but there's a there's a little handful of books that I do tend to reread every few years. Um, Clive Barker's Books of Blood, I sort of revisit <laughs> quite frequently. Uh, but that, the, That's the, on brand. The original, That's on brand. Oh, uh, yeah. And, exactly and, 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 and Clive Barker's amazing, so <laughs> nothing wrong with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. No, but uh, but yeah, the Earthsea books, I just I just love everything about that those books and yeah i've I, it's probably other than barker that's probably the thing i've reread more than anything else well that's that's it's just such a funny coincidence like yeah this reminds me of the time i was i was talking to one of one, someone else on this podcast and i bring up uh, the black company as the book but i was like and he's like oh that's like my favorite book ever i'm like okay then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my it's a top top level book yeah for that guy uh yeah, yeah so Anyway, uh, no, that's that's a good one. I mean, I haven't read any Fonda Lee, but I think, but I really should. I, I, I've aw- I'm aware of her and her work, but it's like I've just not made time yet. But you know, there's also yeah, the I ADHD just, I, that takes my brain and runs in every direction at once, basically. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just discovered her. I mean, I find I find out about a lot of people through Twitter. I really mm. enjoy hanging out on Twitter. Um, and so I, I, I get a lot of book recommendations from sort of friends and book reviewers and other sort of horror fans and fantasy fans and whatever that I just tend to follow and chat with on there. Um, and yeah, and she's one of the discoveries I made through there, which was, yeah, very well. Yeah, I'm very pleased. <laughs> Paid off, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. Well, thanks for being on the show, Alan. Let people know about your uh, where they can find your work. I imagine it's pretty widespread, <laughs> but where can people find book, your like your indie work and your your, your uh, small press work and in traditional stuff? Yeah. yeah well, the, I mean, the best place is just go to my website, which is okay. uh, alanbaxter.com.au. Um, so a l a n b a x t e r dot com dot au. That's the best place to start. You can find links at the top to all my social media, but you'll find everything about all my books there and all the sort of links and blurbs and things you might need. So that's the best place to start. And um, then come and say hi on Twitter or something. I'm always around and happy to chat. All right. Great. And as for this podcast, you can find more of us at mentalsellerpublications.com. And as for me and my books, you can find my books on amazon.com. Or you can find my fiction, because I'm starting to put up some little bits of fiction on my websites, just like samplers, they're tidbits, hopefully to draw people in. Yes, I'm telling you that well, they're, they're meant to trap you like a, like a fly in a Venus flytrap. But you'll enjoy it if you get trapped. So the, those will start going up on my website, timniederwriter.com, Niederwriter is my name, but it's also how you say my name, spelled need a writer on that site. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Alan. Thanks a lot, Alan. It's been great chatting with you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cheers, man. All right. Excellent. uh, Thanks for listening, everybody, and I'll talk to you next week.
That tears it. 